Single player games have a ton of flexibility to try a lot of different things, both narratively and mechanically, that defy the shorthand of multiplayer gaming. While familiarity is good in a single player game, it's not nearly as necessary as, say, the control scheme in a multiplayer game. But sometimes it can go a little bit off the rails. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 single player game concepts that make no sense. And we're talking stuff that just doesn't add up logically speaking, like in the universe of the game rather than stuff that makes games less good. In some cases, it makes games better. It's just weird to see. So without further ado, starting off with number 10, it's the unbreakable, easily breakable doors slash walls. So let's talk Kratos. He is an unstoppable force, at least when the game wants him to be. Sure, he can bring down entire buildings, smash through barriers, cause massive destruction, fight a god like 300 times his size. But what happens when this unstoppable force meets an immovable object? And by immovable object, I of course mean a flimsy wall or a door. Well, there's just nothing that can be done, right? And this pops up so much in recent games. Take any Souls-style game with an abundance of shortcuts. Usually, shortcuts amount to a basic locked door, right? Yeah, you're swinging around a gigantic hunk of metal in the shape of a sword, something so impractical and ridiculous that it's pretty generous to call it a sword. But this little wooden door, mm, can't do anything about that. And the thing that really bugs me is so many of these worlds are run down and dilapidated, like everything's rotting and falling apart. But man, that door is in great shape. It's in such good shape that it can withstand a beating that a boulder can't. Like, why can't we destroy that crappy door? It just doesn't make any sense. But it's another one of those things you have to accept as a gameplay contrivance. The devs want shortcuts that you have to unlock later, so no matter how little sense it makes, they're still there and they are not passable. But Kratos, man, you can turn giant and destroy cities at will. Why is this door giving you guff? At number nine, when you kill an enemy in battle, but then the cutscene starts up and they're fine. I was just thinking about this the other day. I was literally playing Chrono Trigger and they added cutscenes after the fact. And they actually put a cutscene in where a character beats up a bunch of dinosaurs and, and scares them away. And then it cuts back to the game and that character does it again. The same action, but as a sprite. It's kind of the reverse of this problem, but it's also kind of the exact same thing. A recent and particularly infuriating example happens in Wo Long Fallen Dynasty, where the incredibly difficult Lu Bu boss somehow ends in a draw. Like, dude, your health bar is zero. My health bar isn't zero, therefore I win. But the game doesn't want you to beat Lu Bu yet, so I guess you didn't. There's a lot of other examples out there. It's pretty common in JRPGs, and Metal Gear Solid 3 is a pretty funny example where you just riddle Vulgan with bullets in his boss encounter, and he shows up a few minutes later completely fine. It's a trick mostly done to show how badass the enemy is, but sometimes it feels like a cheat. Like, you killed them, they're dead, their health is zero, but the game's not done with their character arc, so none of that. Like, it kind of feels like one of those shootouts with a punk kid on the playground where they come up with excuses for why the shots don't count or something. Like, that kid was annoying then, and this is, it feels the same. And number eight, speaking of cutscenes, cutscene Dante versus in-game Dante. I, I don't need to say anything else if you've played the Devil May Cry series. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, if not, there's a lot of games where your character is a total unstoppable badass in cutscenes and then a flailing dork when you're actually playing as them. I mean, in theory, you could get better at the game and get to the point of the cutscene, but let's say you just started and you don't know how to play the game. How is that guy you? Like, like any cutscene in Devil May Cry 3, Dante can just shrug off dozens of enemies like that are trying to stab him at one time. He's literally a human pincushion, destroys all of them with ease, it's nothing. But then the gameplay starts and those enemies suddenly become actually dangerous. Bayonetta, probably one of my favorite game series of all time, is one that takes this to an extreme too. Cereza can perform completely ludicrous feats and destroy everything in her own special way without breaking a sweat. 
and then it switches to actual gameplay and things get dicier. Tons of games do this, not just over the top character action games. There's plenty of games where the cutscene, your character is way more badass and it's just not possible to even do it in the game. The most absurd example I can think of by a wide margin is a pre-Dark Souls action game from From called Ninja Blade. It's almost like a parody of action games. It's so ridiculous. Every cutscene is totally nuts. Your guy can fly, he runs on walls, he's super mobile, but that's the cutscene. Once you're in control, ooh, it's a game made by From Software, so it ain't like that. Like, you can barely move, his attacks are pretty crappy, and there's invisible walls everywhere, so it's pretty limited in comparison to the cutscenes. Like, I get it. Game devs want there to be cool cutscenes, no matter how much they contradict the gameplay. And most of the time, it's actually kind of funny, but sometimes it's a little disappointing. I don't want to just watch crazy stuff that looks totally badass. I also want to do it. Like, that's what separates a video game from a movie or a TV show, right? At number seven, when uh, in the next game, Batman just leaves all his gadgets at home. You know what I mean? Like, it, one of those things you just have to accept. When a sequel happens, the main character is always just going to forget a bunch of stuff. Going to be lower level, going to lose their equipment. And there may be a reason for it narratively, there may not. A lot of the time, the excuses are pretty flimsy too, but most players go through with it because it's kind of how the game works. With Batman, he's a good example because he's kind of tougher to justify than a lot of them. Like the whole thing is that Batman is a super detective. He's prepared for everything and he knows the drill, so to speak. But in every Arkham game, without fail, he's entering these super villain infested situations with the bare minimum of his equipment. And then he has to like gather it. I get it. It's a video game. Y you want to progress. You want a reason to continue and introduce new mechanics throughout the whole thing. And it's important even in a sequel because it's a video game. But even though they try to justify it a bit by having Batman say all the equipment would slow him down if he carried it all the time. I don't feel slower by the end of the game. You know, when I'm carrying all that equipment. And no matter what game it is, whether it's Batman or Zelda or Metroid or pretty much anything else with a sequel, they have to come up with an excuse why the hero doesn't just start out with all the stuff they had from the last game. And I bring in Zelda, even though, like, most Zeldas take place in different eras. This upcoming one, Tears of the Kingdom, doesn't. And you know this is going to happen in that game. I don't expect the reasons to make sense because that's kind of just what we expect with sequels at this point. This happens so much, the rare time the hero actually does keep everything from the last game, it's kind of shocking. And then, like, the game's villain hits them and they lose all of it. Like, it falls into the sewer or something. And you're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. I don't have all of my stuff. Now we're back to normal. And number six is the abundance of indicators, like climbable walls that are color-coded for your convenience. Um, this is something that I think is probably helpful, but it's also just really strange when you come upon it. Like, it sure is nice someone came out and painted all the climbable walls white so Lara Croft knows where to jump. I mean, like, which one of the henchmen in the crew is the White Knight? Like, who takes the time to paint out all this stuff? Like, ideally, you would want the hero not to get anywhere near you. Mirror's Edge did it right by giving you kind of a random flash of color that's not actually part of the game world, and you can turn it off. And sometimes it can be subtle. Like, there's times when lighting directs people towards something, or the angles of certain things are arranged in a certain way that points your eyes in the right direction. And yet, whoever wrote cut off their limbs in blood on that wall in Dead Space, that makes sense. I get it. But let's say you're a bad guy setting traps. Oh, we got a tripwire over here. Why the hero won't know what's coming. But you know what? It might be kind of hard to tell that you can climb up this thing. So it would be courteous if we, you know, like painted it in a way that sort of indicated that you can. Can we get somebody on that? Why, sure, Dr. Robot. <laughs> I'll even put some signs up that indicates there's a bottomless pit here, just so that Sonic knows to jump there. Like, what is that? Yeah, I get that it's to make it so the player feels like they know what you can and can't climb, or where you can't go, or what have you, but it's super weird. Like, who went around and painted all the crates in the Resident Evil 4 remake with the yellow? What is that? That being said, 
said, it is helpful. And like back in the day, stuff that you could interact with just looked different because it was a polygon on a pre-rendered background or it was more or less detailed than its surroundings or has a different color palette or something. It's not like that anymore. Everything's super detailed. So it's not something I dislike. It's just something that doesn't make any sense at all. At number five, when you have to learn to run. I mean, I don't think I have to explain this one, but let's say you're a video game hero. Uh, You're an over-the-top badass. uh, Sort of comes with the territory, right? You're an expert fighter, expert sword handler, expert with guns, etc. But I guess basic cardio is elusive to you. Uh, Skill tree is kind of a basic fact of life in gaming. Almost every game has some RPG element to them, and that's not a bad thing by itself, but there's some ridiculous situations, like in No More Heroes, where Travis has to learn the fine art of running. Yeah, you have to learn to run. Like You couldn't do it until somebody taught him. And uh, Travis is an adult. He got to that point in his life never having run before. Another particularly silly example is in Just Cause 3, where this highly skilled special agent can't aim until he learns how to do it at a shooting range. Or even from a more general level, like look at Deus Ex. He plays this highly trained special agent who can barely hold a gun at the start of the game. You gotta level up all your stats before you're even halfway decent. It's the contrast between how you're presented in the game versus how worthless your character is at the start. Because, again, there is a need for progression, so it makes sense to some extent. But the point of including those mechanics is to have it be meaningful. And there should be a certain baseline of competency that makes sense. But certain video game protagonists just don't have it. At number four, everything being a puzzle for whatever reason. Now, this is pretty low-hanging fruit. So low, it's probably rotting. But if you want to talk about something that doesn't make sense in single-player games, it's all the puzzles. Like, in a normal, logical world, people lock up their belongings using, like, locks. Not in video games, though. You have to align the shadow puppets to swap the shotgun with the replica shotgun, solve the tile puzzle, or insert three emblems into the Tower of Hanoi to open the lock. Resident Evil is the king of the nonsensical puzzle, but almost every single-player game is guilty of this to some degree. Puzzles are an easy way to break up the gameplay, and they add some variety to the experience, so of course devs are going to shove them into their games. Uh, And certain puzzles have a little more natural of a feeling to them, but there's always at least a little bit of fakeness when puzzles come up. And I'm not saying it's bad. Obviously, it's a video game, and I love a good puzzle. But in the logic of the game world, that random match three segment that I have to do to get past that unbreakable door that I can't do anything about, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. At number three, when video game protagonists refuse to pick up guns. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm always annoyed whenever I play a game. If for some reason your main character just adamantly refuses to pick things up, usually for no reason. Uh, Like, take the Metal Gear Solid games. Every one of them starts with Snake entering a place with the order to procure on site, as in get guns and tools on your own. But without fail, Snake refuses to pick up the guns enemies drop. It took until Metal Gear Solid 5, which is not the fifth Metal Gear Solid, might I add, and also takes place in the past that Snake was finally able to pick things up. I mean, is Solid Snake really that inferior, genetically speaking, to Big Boss that he doesn't think enough to realize that all those guys have guns that he can take? Nah, he's got to go in the hangar and go down that elevator and get past the eight or nine guards with guns to get the gun? I know I'm exaggerating a little, but really. It's particularly absurd when it comes to boss weapons. Like, hey, you can take a boss's soul after beating them, but, you know, they kind of dropped a weapon when I killed them. Why can't I pick the damn thing up? At number two, bullets being weaker when your allies shoot them. Like, in so many games, your allies operate under completely different rules than you. In reality, and I feel like an idiot saying this, but bullets cause a lot of damage. A shot can kill a person, and it doesn't matter who's holding the gun. I mean, other than, like, in terms of aiming skill. In the world of video games, though, if you got a companion who's supposedly better at aiming than you, they're gonna hit that enemy right in the heart repeatedly and for some reason that heart can take it because it's your companion and not you the bad guys like that tickles 
What do you got, player? So I aim and shoot them, and I can kill them in one or two shots in the shoulder or knee. My NPC buddy shot him in the head like three times. Didn't matter, though. Thanks for warming him up. But I got this one. I, I, I know how to kill. It's with a good hand shot. Get him right in the palm. He's done. And number one, when, like, a bunny is stronger than God. Levels can lead to some pretty bizarre situations in games, especially ones that have pretty robust post-game content or a lot of expansions or something. A perfect example of what I mean here comes to us courtesy of Xenoblade Chronicles, where the nonsensical power discrepancy you can find between a literal god that created the game's universe and this bunny with a club that shows up in the end game. Uh, the despotic R scene, the bunny with the club, has a base level of 108. Dwarfing the god of the universe is level 82. And it's just a rabbit, like a randomly super tough rabbit. Makes no sense in the logic of the game world. But hey, that's what happens when you're playing an RPG with fixed levels. There's plenty of other examples of this kind of thing out there, but this one really takes it to the logical extreme. I can't. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconHero. We'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.